Okay, so let's kind of review a little bit what we were talking about. We were talking about unemployment last time. All right, and we saw that in essence there was these four different kinds. We had our frictional, we had our seasonal, we had our structural, and we had our cyclical. And what was the difference between these guys? You guys remember? Yeah, so this guy is like basically when you have a recession, right? So here was our unemployment. From downturns in the economy. Now what were the other three? What was going on with them? Yeah, so here we've got different periods of time where so we could say this just happens on a seasonal basis. Right? So this was the unemployment that occurs like at, in January, right? In February or that occurs in the summertime, right? During the summertime, high schoolers and college kids are off, they go back home, they start looking for jobs, unemployment is gonna go back up, right? What were frictional and structural? Right, so this guy right here is like our first time job entrance. Moving between jobs. And what was our last guy there, our structural? Mm -hmm. So there's been changes in the economy. <laughs> Changes, uh, unemployment from changes in the structure of the economy, right? And normally we kind of think of these guys as being like from technology, but it, it didn't have to be from that. It could be from people simply don't want product X anymore. Whatever that product X is could be anything. Um, so we had these four different kinds of unemployment, and which of these guys did we say was basically kind of good, and which of these guys was bad? These guys right here are good. This guy right here is bad, all right? You want frictional unemployment. I mean, you can have, you can make frictional unemployment equal to zero. The state can say you're going to take this job and you're going to have this job for the rest of your life. And that's what the Soviet Union did. You can do that, right? There's nothing that says that you can't. Um, seasonal is a little bit harder to get rid of, but I suppose that you could just say once you hire somebody, you have to continue to hire them no matter what. Uh, structural, you can say, okay, we're never going to have any changes in the economy. We're never going to have economic growth. We're never going to have any new products or old products that people don't want anymore. I mean, suppose you could do that. But in order to make these guys be equal to zero, that's in essence what you would have to do, right? And the costs of that are much larger than the benefits that you would get, right? So the other one here that we really want to try to focus on getting rid of is the cyclical, right? And interestingly enough, we have something that's called uh, the natural rate of unemployment. And the natural rate of unemployment is basically when only frictional 
seasonal and structural unemployment exists. Right? In other words, we want cyclical to be equal to zero. So in essence, what we're saying is that we want all these other different types of unemployment to, to be, basically we want the bad type of unemployment to not exist. It's what naturally occurs. And the good unemployment we want. So let's try it one more time and see if we can if we can uh, get this web page to work, which I seriously doubt that we can. Uh, we say this guy right here is typically somewhere between four to six percent. But that's not a hard and fast rule. And we're not exactly sure what that number is, but that's just our best guess estimate. We also saw that we could have changes in our unemployment rate for a variety of reasons, right? So we saw that when we were looking at our unemployment rate, It's the number of our unemployed people divided by our labor force. And who is in our labor force? Who did that consist of? Who was in our labor force? <coughs> so these were the people that are working and the people that are looking for work, right? So the people that are unemployed but are looking for work. So what that means, we said, was that, well, it's possible that the unemployment rate could actually go down and that be a sign that things are actually bad. And how could it be that the unemployment rate's going down and things are actually getting worse? Well, how could this guy be going up? Because this guy's changing, right? Because people are coming in or going out. Or this guy could be going down, and that could be because these people that are looking for work are so discouraged, they said, forget it, I'm leaving. I'm going to go do something else. And once they've left the labor force, this part gets smaller, this part gets smaller, and the whole unemployment rate actually shrinks, despite the fact that the economy is not actually better, per se, right? So we have our unemployment right here, and we can see that it got to a high here of, uh, we'll say 10.8% in November of 1982. It looks like about 9.9. .9. We'll just call it, oh, I think I saw a 10 in there briefly. So we'll say about 10% here in uh, September of 2009, and we can see that the unemployment rate has steadily, has fallen steadily since then, right? And remember, these gray areas here are recessions. And you can see periods here where these things don't always match up, right? I mean, for example, here, the unemployment rate's going up. If this is the recession, if gray's recession, then this part right here must be expansion, and the unemployment rate continues to rise a bit, right? But generally, for the most part, and you can see that here with all of these guys, right? Once the expansion begins, unemployment rate begins to fall. Not always, but usually. And so now we're down here all the way at 4.2%, right? So we've said, 
hey, our natural rate of unemployment is somewhere between 4 to 6%. In essence, what we're saying is that, well, the only thing that exists is this frictional, structural, and seasonal. But there's a couple of different ways to look at this. And let's look at this, first of all, through this unemployment rate to see if the unemployment rate is something different. So I would like to go to the CPI website, I mean to the uh, BLS website, but I can't, the Java stuff doesn't, I can't. They've got these computers locked up so tight, they're so worried about viruses, you can't, they're basically useless. I don't know what to do with them. So, we'll just have to hope this other stuff works. Here is our unemployment rate though, that's called, in essence, it's called the U6, right? So in other words, what this guy tries to do is this guy tries to estimate how many of these people We've got all of these people that were looking for work and how many of those people that have left the labor force because they were looking for work, if we could count them, what would the unemployment rate be if they were actually back into the workforce, right? And that's one of the things that they do on that survey when they call up and they say, okay, did you look for a job? No. Why haven't you looked for a job? because I quit looking for work, right? So you're called a discouraged worker. They put you on there as a discouraged worker, all right? So we saw at the height here, this guy was about 10%, but here we see that if we'd included all of those people that were looking for work, that wanted a job, but couldn't find one, had just essentially left the workforce, you see the unemployment right there would have been about 17%, all right? And so we come down today and we see the unemployment rate is, if you look at this guy called U6, about 8.3. So that means that this 4.2% that people are talking about, what, is, what does this guy tell us? And this guy is always going to be higher than, than, the, than the unemployment rate. But what, do we, what does this 8.3 tell us? What does this guy mean? Eight point three was somewhere around in here, February of twenty twelve, something like that. Right? I mean you can see here, here's its like low point right here. This is when they started producing the stats. So here's July of two thousand at seven percent. July of 2000, uh, around 4%, something like that. About 3% higher than it was for the unemployment rate. You see it's about 4% now. What's this guy tell us? 17%, 16%, I mean, what does he tell us? What does he mean? Is the unemployment rate 10% or is the unemployment rate 17%? That's a pretty big difference, right? So which is it, is it 10% or is it 17? No, you don't take the average. Is it 10 or is it 17? But those people would take a job if they could get a job. The economy is so bad they left. So is it 10 or is it 17? Do what? Mm-mm. -mm. No. D 
The answer is one word. Is it 10% or is it 17%? That's, I guess that's technically one word. But that's not the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Depends on which measure you want to look at, right? Do we want to look at what the unemployment rate's definition is? Those who are unemployed but looking for work divided by those who are in the labor force. Seems reasonable enough. 10%. What about all these people that left? Because they couldn't find a job. They got discouraged. Well, if you want to count them, then you can do that. Yes. You can throw them in there. Which one do you think is more accurate? Sure, that sounds good. Kind of depends on what you're trying to measure, what metric you're looking at, etc. right? In other words, there's not a hard and fast rule on this stuff. And just like we said, just like we saw over here, I mean, you can look at not just this stuff, but you could look at, say, we also looked at things like our labor force participation rates. And how did we calculate that guy? What was he equal to? Exactly, right? So we have our labor force here. And we have our uh, population that was 16 and over, right? The people that could be in the labor force that were not institutionalized. Right? And so we can see, I mean, you can look at this guy. I mean, you can make the time period be any that you want it to be. Make it 10 years. So here's where it was 10 years ago. What does this downward trend mean? What is this guy telling us? What are people doing? Mm -hmm. They're leaving the labor force. They're saying, I'm not looking for work, and I'm not working. So if the labor force participation rate is going down, what is this? I put a 10-year on here. How much of this decline is because of this? And I'm just, that question is rhetorical. I want you to understand the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is, is that, well, if people leave the labor force, labor force participation rates can be smaller, unemployment rates can be going down. But that doesn't necessarily mean that things are getting better. It depends upon why people are leaving the labor force. Are people leaving the labor force because they can't find a job? Are they leaving the labor force because they're retiring or because zombies came and attacked them? I mean, what is it? It could be anything. Isn't this like the baby boomer generation, like at the retirement That's what we think some of it is. But some of it is there are large segments of the population that are having a hard time finding work. And you'll hear a lot of people say, well, look at these labor force participation rates. They're the same rates today as we had back in the 70s. And they're making a false comparison because, in essence, what they're saying is they're saying as if this thing is going to continue to do this way forever, right? It's not going to go all the way to 100%. It's not going to go to 90%. It's not going to go to, it's just not going to happen. It's never going to go all the way up there to 100%. It's not going to continue to increase forever. But you can see this through some other different ways.
because you could look at this for um, right. Here's what it's doing for uh, black males, and you can. This is why I like the BLS website. The BLS website, you can narrow it down to black males 20 to 24. I mean, you can get really, really narrow. You can do it white women, the age of 25 to 35 with a college degree, non-married. You can't, I don't know that Fred has that level of detail to it, right? But, uh, so here we have one for, say, African-American males. And let's do it for... I wonder if they have, I don't know if they have white males on here. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. So here's your labor force participation rate for guys. All right. So here's uh, black men, 20 and over, right? Topping off here at around, mm, we'll call it, upper 70s and down here, we're now into the upper 60s. Here's guys, used to be in the 88%, right? 88% of all guys were in the labor force. Now we're all down here into the um, low 70s. What were the black males? Ooh, not that different, right? What are these little why is it doing this? Zoom, 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 zoom. Why is it doing that? These little peaks here like that. That's the seasonal stuff, right? That's that seasonal component. People coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out. What's causing that? That's not baby boomers. <laughs> Sounds good to me. That's one of the answers. That's one of the possible answers that we think, just good old-fashioned laziness. Don't want to get a job. Let's see what it's done for women during that time. Let me know if you see women. That's all women. Ah, oh, here we go right here. All right. So here's our woman down here in the 50s, 30%. And this guy's kind of topped out here at around 60%. It's fallen a little bit during the recession, but not that much. I mean, you can look at this in all kinds of different ways. You do this 10-year one. You can look at this and go back to this guy. I mean, he's pretty steady through here. He's fallen a little bit, right? But he's fallen from, percentage-wise, he's fallen from the 60s to 58, right? So not doing this on a uh, basis point change, but uh, 2, 5, 60, about 3%. Here's our white men. What were we doing? 2000s. We'll call this guy 76-ish, 77. And now he's down to, we'll call him 72s. Five percent change for guys. All right. I mean, it's interesting stuff. And the same thing here for, like, say, unemployment rates, right? I mean, we could look at this in terms of our unemployment rates. You guys are college graduates, 16, 19, no. No, let's not do that. No, oh, this one's usually pretty good. This one's good too. Here's less than a high school diploma, 25 years and over. All right. 
So these guys right here are still pretty high, right? They got as high as 17, they got as high as 18%. Remember that was, this guy right here never got more than 10. Unemployment rate, where's our college graduates? During the recession, the college graduates never got higher than five. And you can also look at this in other ways, all right? I mean, you can say like, let's look at our unemployment rates by male and female. Here's men. They got into the 11 percentage range as opposed to our females. Let me know if you see it. Eight. All right, eight and a half. Your guys were 10. Your bachelor's degrees, 5%. The people that didn't have a high school diploma, 17%, right? You can use this kind of stuff to kind of tease out, you know, who got hurt the most by the recessions, you know, and it was which particular groups of people. Which particular groups of people have, less, have left the labor force? Which particular groups of people are still in the labor force, et cetera? It's all kind of very interesting stuff. It really kind of helps tease out a whole lot more what's going on with particular groups in particular states, et cetera, right? So for example, I hope they have this. Employment rate, West Virginia. I mean, you can look at the unemployment rates in different, in different uh, states. Missouri, Missouri, Missouri. Let me know if you see it. Here we go. How did we do? 9.8, we didn't do so good, all right? Other states might have done a whole lot better. So if we looked at, say, um, I, think, I think Colorado came out okay. If I remember correctly, or maybe they did and I can't remember. They were below the state, I mean, they were below the national. Who was the state that did really well? I can't remember. Was it Texas? Point one, eight point four. I mean, not good, but a whole lot better than other places. So this is a, is a statistic that gives us a lot of valuable information. We can use it to tease out lots of different things. What's happening with recessions? What's happening with expansions? Who's seeing the benefits of expansions? Who's not? Right, it's a pretty it's a pretty good tool for us. Questions? So we've got this thing here. All right. What we want to look at now in unit three we're done with unit two. Now we're going to start unit three as of right this second moving forward. How can we get the economy to stop doing this kind of stuff? And let me show you why this is important. So 
So let's go back, say, not to 2007. Let's go back to, say, 2000. And can I get this guy up or down? I don't want him down. I want him like here. All right. I mean, we've got this recession here. What would happen if rather than having this recession, we had kind of continued along like this? This difference right here is a ton of money. And I know because I've calculated it when I'm giving speeches and stuff. Somewhere in the range of around ten to twelve thousand dollars per person. That's a lot of money. Can you imagine how better you'd feel if you had an extra ten thousand dollars? That's a lot of money. It adds up, right? So one of the things that we want to try to understand here in Unit Three is how can we take a lot of this stuff? What are the kind of things that we can do, if anything? Maybe there's nothing we can do to keep the economy from falling into recession, right? To keep it from growing too fast, to keep things like inflation to keep things like inflation from being, you know, 10% and 10% and you know, having inflation be relatively low, because we know inflation can be bad even if it's relatively low and steady. It still has lots of problems. All right. So what we want to do is we want to create some models of the economy. Now, let me just tell you, if this was a Principles of Micro class, we could use the same textbook from 1902 if we wanted to. We understand micro very well. Okay? Micro deals with the cost for firms and prices and output. That stuff's pretty easy to calculate, right? I mean, the formula for cost doesn't change. It's the same formula today that you had in 1577. Stuff costs what stuff costs. Macro, though, is a little bit different, right? Because when we're looking at models for the economy in a macro sense, we have lots of different models, dependent upon the assumptions that we use and dependent upon the level of detail that we want to look at, right? So, for example, How do I get from New York to LA? I'll bring this back down so you can see. How do I get from New York to LA? I don't want to fly, I want to drive. Okay, here we go. It's a little bit easier. Right? I mean, you're going to take I-95 down to... Washington, come on over to such and such over here, and you take this guy over, blah, 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 and you can come over. I mean, right when you get down into here, 
there's not as many options, right? You don't want to go up. That doesn't make sense. So let's go backwards. This is uh, Interstate 40 to... Oh, we can take 40 all the way over. So we could take 95 to Petersburg, take 85 down to 40, and take 40 over, right? Clark. Let's suppose you wanted to do it. I mean, you can do it any way you wanted to, right? You can do it any way that you wanted to go. In a really, really broad, in the broadest sense, how do I go from New York to LA? Not highway, just how do I get there? I'm in New York, which direction do I need to go? West, right? There's the broadest sense. Don't go east, if you go east, you're gonna have problems, right? <laughs> you go west. And then you can see, you can kind of zoom in on your map, your model. That's exactly what a map is. A map is a model. It's a model of the world. You can zoom in a little bit on your model and you can say, okay, in the broadest sense, I go west. In a more deliberate sense, I go this interstate, right? In... One four seven North Third Street, Brooklyn, New York. I just made up an address. Okay, I don't. I, I completely made that up. So here I am. I'm at one forty seven North Third Street in Brooklyn, New York, and I want to go to uh, five two six. Ventura Boulevard, California. LA, where, I don't know. I just go backwards. Right? I mean, when you're zooming in on this guy, the directions get a little bit more complicated, right? Because now it's, okay, leave on North 3rd Street, come this way to Metropolitan Avenue, take Metropolitan Avenue this way down to down to Marcy Avenue, take Marcy Avenue, get on the Brooklyn Queens Express for a little bit, get on 275, go past all this stuff, right? And this map, this model, doesn't show us all of the details, right? It doesn't show us this tree right here, or I guess it's an empty lot. No, it's a tree. I guess there's a lot there, I don't know. It doesn't show us these trees over here, right? Where's our map again? We're, we're on this road right here. How do you do your place your guy there? There we go. See, our map doesn't show us all this stuff right here. It doesn't show us past this bush, go past this sign, past these other sets of trees right here. Go past the building, go past the Wyeth Avenue, Kent Avenue, right lane exit and continue to go straight. Continue to do this. Go under this bridge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see what I'm saying? You can make it as detailed as you want it to be. You understand what I'm saying? It's the exact same way with these models. We can make these models of the economy as detailed as we want them to be. However, the more detailed the model becomes, what's true about the model? It becomes more complex. 
That's exactly right. And we're not interested in knowing how many trees there are along this road. We're just interested in knowing how do we get from New York to L.A. In a broad sense, go west. In a more specific sense, take Highway 95 to 85 to 40. Or in a really specific sense, take whatever road it was we were on, 3rd Street to Marcy Avenue to the Queens, Brooklyn, blah, blah, blah. To a really, 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 really specific sense. Past 12 bushes, turn left. Right? So we're going to be dealing with primarily two different models of the economy. The first one is called the ADAS model. Second one's the Keynesian model, right? And these two different models have different assumptions, and we can alter the assumptions a little bit in each of these to make them kind of variations of these guys. And that's what we're going to do. But in essence, we're going to use these two models to help us understand a lot of what's going on in the economy. Now, are these the only two models you think that exist? There's a ton of them. Right? There's the ADAS model, there's the real business cycle model, there's the Keynesian model, neo-Keynesian, adaptive expectations, rational expectations, uh, real business cycle theory, if I mentioned that one already, I can't remember. Uh, classical model, neoclassical model, supply side model. There's tons of them. All based upon slightly different assumptions, trying to understand slightly different things. And some of them are trying to understand some things and some of them are trying to understand a lot of things, right? So some of the models try to understand a little bit of, they want to understand some particular aspect of the macro economy in a lot more detail. Other ones want to understand what's going on in a much broader sense, but they all have essentially the exact same goal, right? And just like all models, they're not going to be perfect representations of reality, but that's okay. We don't need them to be a perfect representation of reality. We need them to tell us how to get from point A to point B. And what does it mean to go from point A to point B? We don't need necessarily all of the detail along that line. Okay. So that's what we're going to be starting with on Wednesday.